Hi everyone, my name is David Summer. I'm the CTO at Barrelwise Technologies. And today we're going to be talking about managing free sulfur dioxide in barrels to maximize wine quality. The main objective today is to try to gain a better understanding of some of the underlying processes that affect the management of free SO2 in barrel and how we can leverage this understanding to make more informed decisions. I'd like to go through an example of how quality variations and the resulting barrel downgrades can have a significant impact on a winery's bottom line. Then we'll consider the different activities of free SO2 management in detail. And finally, we'll consider the interactions between dissolved oxygen, free sulfur dioxide, and microbes in barrel and how we can leverage this understanding to make better decisions about our barrel program. First off, let's talk about why we care about managing free sulfur in a barrel program by looking at how quality variations across a barrel aged wine program can have a monetary impact. So we have fruit coming in that's ranging in quality and price. Maybe we spend $8,500 a ton on this fruit coming in for our top tier wines and $3,000 a ton for fruit coming in for our mid tier program. Now the fruit is going to have some variance in quality as it comes in and then it's all going into tank and getting homogenized together for ferment. And the winemaking team is striving for the best possible fermentation conditions that they can achieve. And then eventually this homogenous tank is going to get split out into many much smaller vessels for aging. These barrels, because of a variety of different factors, go on their own different aging trajectories with some variance in quality and characteristic uh, throughout the aging period. And the winemaking team is then going to work hard to apply their palate and their experience to try to build the best possible blends that optimize quality, alignment with consumer preferences, uh, and market fit. So in this example, let's say that we have three barrel age SKUs as well as one bulk wine SKU. If we take one barrel that was destined for our top tier SKU and decide that it's not of sufficient quality and we downgrade it to our mid tier SKU, that single barrel would result in a lost revenue opportunity of almost $14,000. Similarly, if a barrel from our lower tier barrel SKU doesn't make the cut and ends up being relegated down to our bulk program, that's a lost revenue opportunity of $3,900. And as you might expect, these losses are more significant for higher tier SKUs, where each individual barrel has a higher value. Now, I know that free SO2 is not responsible for all barrel downgrades. Some are stylistic decisions or perhaps based on oak characteristics or market factors, but we do know that there is a relationship between free SO2 and wine quality. To exemplify that, we surveyed 70 winemakers from all around the world and of the winemakers that we surveyed, 98% of them agreed that maintaining target free SO2 levels is important to wine quality when barrel aging. So what is it about free SO2 that makes it so important for barrel aging? I mean, we always hear that it's special because it's both an antimicrobial and an antioxidant. I like to think of sulfur dioxide role in more general terms, that free SO2 reduces risk and improves consistency. We also asked these winemakers that we surveyed how they sample their barrels in order to maintain these target free SO2 levels. And as you'd expect, this changed depending on how big their cellar was. So for really small wineries with less than 100 barrels, the majority of the respondents reported that they actually take samples from every single barrel and measure these samples separately to determine free SO2. Some winemakers in this group also sampled all of the barrels, but they measured just a composite of these samples blended together while the remaining winemakers sampled and measured only a small subset of the barrels within each group of their winery. Now, with increasing number of barrels, the proportion of wineries that measure only a subset of barrels increases. For survey respondents with more than 500 barrels, none of them reported sampling or measuring every single barrel. In these larger facilities, they sample and measure only a small subset of these barrels, typically between 5 and 10% of a group, and assume that this applies to an entire barrel group. Let's take a look at an example of what the implications of this assumption are. In this example, we have 56 barrels of Merlot that have been in barrel for about six months. So if we sample three barrels from this group and take a composite of these samples and analyze them for free SO2, we would get a concentration of 33 parts per million. And we essentially assume that that free SO2 level is representative of that entire group. To investigate this, we sampled and analyzed the free sulfur concentration of every barrel within this group, and this is what we actually saw. The assumption that each barrel in this group is at 33 parts per million does not hold very well, with some of these barrels as low as 14 ppm, which for this wine is a molecular SO2 of around 0.15 ppm. 
And the winemaker in the study deemed that this was considered critically low and wanted to add KMS to these barrels specifically to bring them up towards a set point to reduce the risk of microbial or oxidative faults presenting in these particular barrels. So the obvious question to ask at this point is, is this just a one-off? Was this a particularly bad group of barrels? To answer this, we measured more than 2,000 different barrels across 60 different barrel groups from 16 wineries that ranged in both size and price point. And I'll share those results in just a moment, but if we're gonna be comparing many different barrel groups rather than looking at individual barrels, it's easier to look at the distribution of free SO2 measurements within a barrel group. The width of this distribution is gonna to correspond to the number of barrels within this group that have the corresponding concentration of free SO2. It's also more useful to convert these measurements into molecular sulfur dioxide, which takes into account the differences in pH for all of these different batches of wine. Now, if we take the molecular SO2 distribution of the example barrel group that we had and compare it to other groups of many different wines across several different wineries, we can see that the variation in SO2 in this group is actually fairly typical. What do we think causes these variations? Why would the same wine in similar barrels in the same cellar sitting right beside each other vary so much in free SO2 levels? Well, we're still trying to understand this, but in some cases, say here, where we have a few barrels that are roughly double or half of the rest of the group, these are likely the result of human error, where one barrel addition was missed or a barrel received a double dose. But what about some of these other groups that have a smooth variation across the entire group? Take these two groups, for example. Group A, with 35 barrels, was just barreled down from a tank a week ago, and as you'd expect, we saw only a few parts per million variation within it. Group B, on the other hand, with 53 barrels, went to barrel 10 weeks ago and has only been topped and sampled since. It has not received sulfide additions, yet we're still seeing considerable variation forming within that group. Okay, so that's already a lot of information and a lot of violin plots. So far, we've looked at how free SO2 is important for managing risk in a barrel program, and how this can affect barrel downgrades, which can have a significant financial impact. We also saw almost ubiquitous variation in free SO2 within barrel groups. Now, I'd like to break down the different processes and look at how each step affects the winemaking team's ability to make decisions and ultimately how it affects wine quality. We start with homogeneous wine and tank, and it's broken down into many small, high surface area handcrafted vessels. The wine experiences many complex interactions between the barrel, microbes, DO, and the environment, all of which are also going to be interacting with the free SO2 levels in the barrel. Now, the winemaking team has several opportunities to intervene and manage this process to yield consistent performance in alignment with particular stylistic goals and risk tolerance levels. This cycle consists of a feedback loop where wine samples are drawn from barrel, somehow the samples are analyzed for free SO2, and then the winemaker is provided with this information and makes a decision if the levels are acceptable or if an addition is required and more sulfites are going to be added to that barrel. So first we'll look at how sampling methods can impact decision making in this cycle. Let's revisit our 56 barrel group from before and look at the information we would receive as a winemaker managing this group. We might ask for a composite sample of three of these barrels and get a value of 32 parts per million. Or our seller team might sample these three barrels and we're given a value of 20 parts per million or 36 parts per million for these three barrels. If we repeat this experiment 100 times, look at the difference in information that we would be receiving as a winemaker. And based on that information, we might actually choose different actions. If we receive a value in this range, for example, maybe we say that group looks great and choose to do nothing. Maybe we get one in this range and we decide that we want to add 15 parts. Or maybe we get one of these seven measurements here and we're really concerned about the level and think that this group really needs a 25 part add ASAP. So depending on what information we're given, we may also choose to make different decisions that are going to impact this feedback loop of the sulfur management cycle. Now, once these samples are obtained, there are several different methods available for measuring the concentration of free sulfur dioxide. When comparing different free SO2 analysis methods for barrel management, I think it's most useful to compare the accuracy of the measurement and the speed of the analysis or the maximum throughput. 
as that dictates how many barrels can be analyzed with the resources that are available. At the low end of the speed axis, we have aeration oxidation, or AO. You'll notice I've drawn it quite long in the accuracy axis, and that's because, in my experience, the accuracy really depends on the skill of the technician performing the analyses. We also see the ripper method used frequently, either manually or semi-automated, and some faster, more expensive, and more automated methods, including FTIR, uh, some newer voltammetry methods, and automated analyzers that can perform wet chemistry on, on multiple samples. None of these methods are really optimized for barrel-by-barrel -barrel analysis, where they have both the throughput to reasonably sample and analyze every barrel, and the accuracy to be the same or better than AO. At BarrelWise, we developed an automated sampling and free SO2 analyzer specifically for barrel-by-barrel -barrel analysis. I don't want to get into the details of our technology too much in this video, but please check out our website if you'd like to learn more. Okay, so we've measured a free SO2 value of our sample, and we've decided to make an addition. Let's consider what happens in barrel when we add sulfites. For this study, we chose two of the more common methods for adding sulfites to barrels an aqueous potassium metabisulfite solution, and effervescent or Camden tablets. We want to understand how these additions affect wine throughout the barrel and how this changes over time. We built an experimental facility with barrels instrumented with several sampling points at different locations where we could draw a small sample and analyze it for free SO2. Now in both cases, we made an addition equivalent to raising the concentration of the whole barrel by 40 part per million. And it's important to note that these barrels were left alone after additions. They weren't stirred or moved with a forklift. For the aqueous KMS solution case, we can see on day one, about an hour after the addition is made, that only about a quarter of the addition has made it up to the top of the barrel, with the majority of the addition concentrated at the bottom. As we march forward in time, we see some more of the sulfites diffusing towards the top of the barrel, but still only about half of the addition has made it to the top after about a week of time. For the effervescent tablet case, again with a 40 ppm addition, we see that on day one, after about an hour or so, half of the addition has made it to the top of the barrel from the effervescent action. The remainder of the addition is at the very bottom surface of the barrel. Again, as we march forward in time, we see some more of this addition diffusing upwards, but still, after almost two weeks, we have a small concentrated layer remaining at the bottom of the barrel. Now imagine sticking a wine thief here at the top versus into the middle might make a difference of 10 or 20 ppm to your measurement. And what we can learn from this simple experiment is that stratification is possible when concentrated sulfites are added to a barrel. If you sample and analyze a barrel for free SO2 and see an unexpected reading, you could consider resampling at a different depth in order to discern if this is a problem of stratification or not. And to attempt to sample at a constant depth between barrels so that you can make an apples to apples comparison. In the experiment that we just discussed, the barrels were not stirred. We do indeed see that stirring barrels after an addition prevents the stratification from forming. However, we've also observed some other impacts from stirring. In one winery study, we performed sulfide additions to 100 barrels, and then half of the barrels were left unstirred and sealed, and the other half of the barrels were open and stirred vigorously to incorporate the sulfites. And the group that was opened and stirred, we saw that the barrels consumed almost 20 parts per million more, on average, of free SO2 than the group that had remained sealed. We hypothesized that this is caused by the additional oxygen and potentially microbes that are incorporated and folded into the wine with vigorous stirring. What I want to highlight with this study is that although stirring barrels does indeed break up sulfite stratifications, there are other factors to consider and stirring should be more of a contextualized stylistic decision that's made for each wine. Now we've seen how the information that the winemaking team has available can impact the decision making in the free SO2 management cycle. Rather than propagating limited information through the cycle, if we instead consider more detailed sampling, with accurate free SO2 measurements and barrel-by-barrel -barrel addition decisions, it's possible to maintain a tighter level of control on barrel variance. An example of this can be seen in this small premium winery for these 13 barrel groups. The winery employed a typical sulfite management program, taking AO readings from a couple of barrels in each group and then making additions to all barrels based on these readings. In this study, we sampled each barrel individually and worked with the winemaking team to target specific barrels that required sulfite additions and left those barrels alone that did not require any sulfite additions. You can see that this change of SO2 management strategy resulted in much more consistent levels across all of the barrel groups, bringing all barrels closer to the respective set points. 
Now, the final element in our free SO2 management cycle is the one that we have the least control over, the biochemical interactions that are taking place within the barrel. We know that free SO2 plays a critical role in those biochemical interactions. That is, after all, why it's used in winemaking. We can illustrate this by looking at the relationship between free SO2 and volatile acidity for our same 56 barrel group as before. I think it's interesting to ask ourselves here, what is it that makes a barrel fall into this cluster here, where we have steady, consistent free SO2 values and low steady volatile acidity levels, compared to this cluster here, where the barrel has a propensity to consume sulfites more rapidly, and we see a marked increase in volatile acidity concentrations. So there's obviously some relationship here, and it's particularly interesting, I think, because free SO2 is unique amongst wine chemicals in that it can be both a symptom of a problem and is often the treatment itself to that problem. We may add free SO2 to a barrel to deal with dissolved oxygen, but some of the free SO2 binds up in that process, reducing its concentration. Similarly, as an antimicrobial, some of the free SO2 will bind up to different chemicals inhibiting growth. With changes in DO and microbes, we would expect to see a change in metabolites like VA. What we end up with is this interconnected relationship between DO, free SO2, and VA. To explore this relationship further, we performed an experiment in winery where we took a group of about 30 barrels. And at the start of the experiment, we measured the free SO2 and the volatile acidity concentrations of each barrel. Then, for the next seven months, we measured only the concentration of free SO2 and any sulfide additions that were made to each barrel. At the end of the experiment, we again measured volatile acidity for each barrel. The hypothesis is that we can estimate the level of VA in each barrel based only on free SO2 and sulfide addition data. So here we can see that initial free SO2 and VA reading. Then, each month, we measure the free SO2 and additions and model the predicted VA concentration based on this free SO2 data. After the seven months has elapsed, we can compare the predicted VA concentration to the final measured value, and we see that they agree quite well. Now, in this barrel, we see it holds free SO2 well and has a fairly steady, slow VA climb. In contrast, with this barrel, which already at its first measurement was showing a lower free SO2 level, an addition was made, some of those sulfites are bound right away before the next month's measurement, another corrective addition was made, which brings up the free SO2 concentration, but maybe not as much as we may have expected. We see that the model predicts a higher level of VA from this barrel based on this free SO2 consumption history, and we do indeed see that from the lab results as well. Our hope is that these data can provide an early warning to winemakers when issues are first detected, so that they can focus their energies and limited resources to dealing with problematic barrels before any quality changes are observed. Well, thank you everyone who's made it this far. I know that was a lot of information to cover. As a quick recap, we saw how free SO2 is important in controlling risk in a barrel program, how preventing barrel downgrades has significant financial impact, that composite sampling can exacerbate variance. Conversely, we saw how barrel by barrel sampling and custom additions can reduce variance. We saw some experimental results that showed how sulfites can stratify in a barrel, affecting protection levels and free SO2 measurements. And finally, we looked at how information on dissolved oxygen and microbial activity can be garnered from free SO2 records alone. And that's all we have time for today. So thank you everyone for watching and hopefully we see you soon.